so this talk I think is going to be pretty different uh, compared to some of the other talks that we've seen today. You know, the typical talk we've seen today kind of has the general workflow of, oh, I have some data, it's highly specialized to my field, and I need to create a tool to visualize that data. Uh, mine is kind of backwards, but also kind of forwards. Uh, so I don't have a tool, number one. Um, I have a idea of how to use visualization to learn more about models. Uh, so I'm a PhD candidate at Iowa State. I'm finishing up uh, in August, hopefully. Uh, and so I work with uh, network models, and specifically social network models. And I use the visualization to learn more about the models. So that's a little bit different than what you've seen previously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first present a uh, motivating example. So I'm speaking on uh, biotech day at PlotCon, and I have never worked with a single genomic anything in my life. Um, and so I have sort of a motivating example from biology. And then I uh, want to thank uh, Keith for throwing up that image of that uh, skeleton, because that's totally me <laughs> trying to get some uh, data to use. Um, so instead of doing that data, I'm just going to show you a motivating example and then do some data that I have in my working example. And then we're going to go into the model. Um, and I'm going to warn you, there is some math. Um, but I have to show you the math in order to show you why visualizing it is so cool and really helpful for understanding it. So here's the motivating example. And this is uh, just a fun animation from The Guardian. And you can see here that they have all these different populations. Um, the blues are vaccinated for measles. Uh, the yellows are susceptible to measles. The yellows with the blue outline uh, have been vaccinated, but they're still susceptible. And then once they turn red, they're infected. And you'll see, once I start running the simulation, um, that there's some red ones flying in, infecting the populations. So this is just a, a visualization of how herd immunity works. You see once something gets infected and the population is not protected, uh, you uh, have a lot of infected people and a, a very high um, infect, infected rate. And then you see once you get up to 90% and 99% vaccination rates, uh, you see the population is pretty protected. And even down here, uh, nobody interacted with an infected person. And so uh, the population was still protected. Um, but these little petri dishes uh, don't exactly describe human interaction, right? Um, we know that people have specific behaviors, they have specific beliefs that might influence them to choose whether or not to get their children vaccinated, whether that's, you know, a religious belief or maybe they just don't have the access to that. Uh, so we have some more questions about um, vaccination that maybe this animation doesn't answer. So things like, uh, how do these beliefs spread within a population? How does that affect the vaccination rate? How can we target uh, vaccination uh, programs to specific communities? And my question is, can we use network modeling to answer these specific questions? Um, and so this is where I say, wow, that would be great, but I don't have any data. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to move to the data that I do have that I've been working with for a little while now while I'm working on my dissertation. Um, so this is a, another public health concern. We have um, a data set with underage uh, teenagers in it, and we want to look at their drinking and smoking behavior. Um, this is some old data. As you can see, it's um, pretty, pretty old, about 20 years old. Um, and we have some panel data, uh, three waves of, of teenagers observed in this study, um, starting when they were 12 and 13 to when they were 14 and 15. And each student uh, is surveyed, and they list up to six friends. So this is going to be a directed network. Um, and then they also collect their smoking and drinking behavior, um, as well as some other lifestyle variables and information about their families. Uh, so the study I cite at the top um, has uh, 160 students in total. And there's some example data uh, that only has about 50. And I'm going to use an even smaller subset of 16 female students. Uh, so this is what the data that I'm working with look like. Uh, you can see that there are four levels of the drinking behavior variable. So one is never all the way up to four being once a week. Um, and remember, these are 12 to 13-year-olds all the way on the left and 14 to 15-year-olds all the way on the right. 
Um, and you can see that there's definitely some changing dynamics in the friendship network over time. Uh, for example, in the first wave, you see there's the two big clusters and then it breaks up a little bit and then it breaks up even more. And you might even say, well, looks like that triangle with the 14, 10, and 11, they seem to be getting closer together over time and further away from the others and also their behavior is changing as well. So maybe um, the drinking is isolating them from each other or from the rest of the students. Um, and I have been a teenage girl um, and some of you may have teenage girls or have also been teenage girls, so you know that this is a complicated thing that we might want to model, right? Might want to learn about friendships. And we want to determine how friendships can change um, risky behavior and vice versa. And we want to do this over time as well. And so the solution for this that uh, I'm using is the stochastic actor-oriented models. And I'm going to refer to these as SALMs. So if, you ever, if I'm saying a strange word, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so they're very aptly named. They're stochastic because they model change over time. They're actor-oriented because they take into account um, behavior uh, covariate uh, information. So you might have the drinking behavior taken into account when modeling the network change. And you can also um, take into account the network structure, so the already existing friendships, for example, um, when you're modeling the behavior change. And so here, the actors are the girls and the nodes, and the ties are their friendships between each other. Uh, so how do these things work? Um, I said that they were complicated, and that's true. Um, and I'm going to take a subset of them where I'm just going to consider modeling network change over time. So I'm not worrying about the changing behavior for now because this is already complicated enough. And so there's two things that we know about networks, especially dynamic networks, is that they do, one, uh, change over time, and that they are very dependent. So there's a complex dependency structure going on there. Um, so there's, these are two problems. We have um, discrete observations, but we know that you know, all those changes didn't happen the second that that network was observed. They happened over time, so how do we account for that? And we're going to account for that with um, creating some unobserved data. And we're going to do that with a continuous time Markov chain. And I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, and then we know that there's a dependent structure. And so we're going to take that into account by conditioning on the first observation of our data, so wave one. And then we're also going to condition on all of the ties um, in the network. Once we get into the continuous time Markov chain, we're only going to worry about one node and one set of ties at a time. Uh, so once we have, um, so what exactly is this Markov chain process doing? So we're going to follow, so a Markov chain is, you know, steps over time, and they're all, um, it's memoryless, right? So we're going to choose one actor at a time, and we're going to say that's actor I, and we're going to say, okay, actor I, I am allowing you in this model to make a change. And the probability of choosing which actor is actor I uh, depends on the rate function. So that's the first part of this process. Um, and then the second part of this process is that actor I then tries to optimize its utility function um, by changing ties or not. So it wants to become friends with you know, the cool people and it wants to ditch the less cool people or something like that, right? Uh, so the, that's the second part of this is the, um, the utility function. So the first part is the rate function. Um, and I promised somebody I was speaking to earlier that I wouldn't have too many Greek symbols. So there's only one Greek symbol so far uh, in the math. So we have um, a simple rate parameter. And we're just going to keep it really simple. You can do all sorts of things with this rate function. It can be a, a function of the network statistics or of the actor level covariates. But we're just going to keep it simple and say that every actor gets the same chance to act at any time point. So the probability that you're going to choose any one actor is just 1 over n, so where n is the number of actors in your network. So this is an example of the first few steps in the Markov chain. Um, so what we have here is each node is chosen with probability 1 over n, and you can see that it creates, so that first node creates a tie, the second node creates a tie, and the third node deletes a tie. So these are all, each individual node optimizing their own objective function based on uh, the current state of the network at that time. Um, another interesting part of this is you can see how the network 
uh, the node link diagram also uh, changes when you add and remove a tie, which is pretty interesting. So then what exactly is the utility function? So that's their objective function. Um, and I've up to three Greek symbols now, uh, but I think that's it. So uh, we have, a, it's a function of the current network state, any covariates. Um, we have some statistics that we might want to collect on the network itself and on the actors on their covariates. And then we have some parameters that we want to fit because I'm a statistician, there's always parameters. Um, and there can be any number of these parameters added to the model. Last time I checked, there were like 87 possible parameters, which is a lot. Um, and this can be problematic, um, which we'll get to later. And then there's uh, transition probability. It's a little easier to think about probabilities instead of some obscure function. Um, and so you don't have to worry about this equation too much, just worry about the pij. So that's the probability that when actor i is chosen, it changes the tie to actor j. So what does that look like? Okay, so this here is um, the transition probability for all of the actors in my network. So what I did was I simulated 1,000 transitions from the first wave to the second wave. And this is just the first step in each one of those. Um, so we have uh, the, on the x-axis is the chosen actor, and then on the y-axis is the actor it chose to change its relationship to. And I have used Plotly because this is PlotCon. And so you can hover over and see the really dark nodes are the ones with the highest probability, and the lighter node, or the lighter bars are um, the lower probabilities. So this was a nice way to visualize that transition probability and we, we kind of can't see any decisive patterns yet, but it helps us understand what's going on in the model. Uh, and then we might want to learn about the parameters that we're putting in our model. Um, and so these are just an example of the parameters. I've split them up into two groups. There's a network effect. So how does the, the structure of the network affect what's going on? And then how does the covariate of the actor affect what's going on. And I have some pictures. So we have the first one is a popularity one. Uh, you can see that, you know, you have the green, the green node here is the acting node, so it's popular, so it wants to be more popular, so it creates ties to new nodes. Um, and then this other one is encouraging reciprocal relationships. So if green, if yellow says green is my friend, then green is encouraged to say that yellow is my friend. And then we have this transitive one where your friend becomes my friend. And then we get down to the covariate ones where we have the effect of my friend's behavior on my friendship, um, the effect of my behavior on my friendship, and then we have this birds of a feather flock together one. So that's just a little, a few of the <laughs> parameters you can add into the model. Uh, and so we'll get into one model right now. Um, this is just a small example. We fit three models overall, but I'm just going to start with one. We have a kind of a straw man one that has only two parameters in it. And then what I did was I simulated a thousand times like I did with the previous one. And you can see on the left here, so all the way on the left is wave one, and all the way on the right is wave two. And these are three instances in between of ways that the, the model, the continuous time Markov chain, simulated from one wave to the second wave. And you can see that some um, edges are created, then they drop out, then they're created again, then they drop out again, then they're created, then they drop out, then they're created again, and all the way, then there they are in the data. Um, so these are just three instances, and it looks like each one of these individually doesn't necessarily accurately describe what's going on in the data. It doesn't necessarily accurately describe the model because you can see there's a lot of gaps where there's um, a tie on one side on the, in the model, the model says there's a tie there, but the data says there's not a tie there. So what's another way to look at these? Uh, we might want to look at a summary network. So we take that same data and we show edges that show up um, more than 5% of the time in our final wave two. So I've, I've simulated wave two a thousand times from my straw man model, and I have uh, drawn it next to the first wave and the second wave. 
Um, and you can see that when you look at it this way, it's actually doing uh, a pretty good job. Uh, it looks like maybe it misses one or two in the middle here, um, but it gets the basic structure right. Um, and it also uh, tends to create ties where there shouldn't be. Um, there's reciprocated ties over here where there shouldn't be in the data. Uh, we have some other models as well. Um, we chose to add um, parameters to our straw man model based on their low p-values according to the software that we use in R. Um, and we add one with a significant covariate effect added. So that means that we take into account the drinking behavior. And then we also add one that's just another structural one um, just to sort of see how that would change things. And some questions we might want to have answered here are um, how do these additional parameters affect the model fit? And also, uh, can we visually see the significance of these parameters? Uh, so first, let's look at um, some distributions here. So what I've done um, is I uh, fit the model 1,000 times, and I took the estimates from each of the 1,000 um, fits of the parameters, and I have plotted them here. Uh, so first, uh, let's look at model one versus model three. So you can see here that the beta one estimates, that those distributions are pretty much right on top of each other for the two models. So that's a good ind indication that it's fitting it consistently. Um, but maybe over here in alpha two and beta two, the distribution's a little bit shifted. So it, something is different there. Um, and we might want to explore that further. Uh, then we look at model one versus model two. And you can see that the distributions are very different. Um, so this is where uh, earlier I said, you know, this might be problematic. Um, this is definitely problematic here because you can see that if I fit one model, beta one is totally separate um, in model one versus model two, the distributions are totally different. So uh, it also affects uh, the rate parameters, which is um, quite problematic. And uh, we can also look at a correlation matrix. So we put each of the, the parameters uh, in a matrix and we visualize them. And so things we don't want to see are things like this relationship, beta one versus beta two. Um, we don't want to see those two parameter estimates be highly correlated like that. That's not good for our, for our model. Something is going on in the way it's being fit. Um, and then what we do want to see is something more like this with beta four and alpha two where there's just kind of a generic blob of points. Um, so this can help us learn more about what is actually going on underneath the hood when we do fit these models. Uh, we can also look at some uh, other summary networks. So we can take our, the same thing we did with model one where we did, uh, we fit 1,000, or we simulated wave two 1,000 times, and then we take the, five, the ones that occur 5% of the time, we take the edges that occur 5% of the time or more. And you can see, again, um, that the general structure is captured in each of these, um, but there's perhaps some things that are going on in model two, uh, like there's this 12 to six tie that's not in the data, and it's also not there in model one or model two, so maybe model two is not such a good idea. Um, and then there are a lot of issues with the reciprocal ties, again, so in the data, five goes to three, but three does not go to five, and you can see that these are being uh, included here in the model, and that might be an argument for removing um, one of our parameters from our model. Uh, so what did we do? Um, golly gee willikers, that was fast. Um, we can use visualization uh, to learn about our modeling, and as a statistician, this is something that we might want to do because, you know, so often we just get a p-value and move on, and we might want to learn more about what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so these are the principles of model visualization, uh, which is you can put the model in the data space instead of just putting the data in the model space. Uh, you might want to also look at collections. So those are more informative than singletons. Um, and then you want to explore the process and not just the end result. So an example of model in the data space might be something like this, where we look at a bunch of simulations from a model and we put it into the data, among the data, and see what's going on. Um, the collections, we looked at the distributions of the estimates to see what's going on, and we looked at more than one, just one model. And then we also explored the process, and so we looked at the underlying, uh, what was going on with the Markov chain, and we looked at a little bit of the 
uh, animation of what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, so uh, that's it, and I guess there's a lot of time for questions, and thank you so much for listening. So uh, a couple of things. One is how, what metric do you use for accuracy? So like we talk about this particular edge is not there or is there, but like generally you want your loss function to be essentially a single number that's coming out, right? Can you repeat that last part again? I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, so you want you want your loss function where you're optimizing your model to be a number that you can like try to push down. So is there is there a metric for this is they don't have the same edges, but this is a better incorrect network than this other incorrect network, right? It seems right. like you need that for modeling. Yeah, definitely. So that's a really hard question for network modeling. Um, and there's, all, there's certain goodness of fit statistics that are used in network modeling. Um, I don't like any of them, and I don't think that they do a very good job. So um, another part of my thesis that I'm working on is uh, visual inference. So we want to do this in a visual way. So if we add a parameter to a model and we simulate a bunch of models from it, or excuse me, a bunch of network observations from it, can we detect that difference if we stick in the data um, into that. So that's another part of my uh, thesis, and that's definitely something that's an open question for sure in this field. And uh, so one more um, question, which was, um, it seems like the memoryless property is not desirable in terms of tracking friendships, right? Like if you were friends with someone when you were young, that probably affects your relation to them in the future, right? But uh, this model is not going to capture anything like that at all. Is that right? Uh, yes. So the, the reason we have the memorialistness property is just so we can um, fit the models through simulation because they're really, they're pretty intractable models. Um, and most of the estimation right now that's done in the software is um, method of moments estimation. Like uh, only recently have the likelihood functions even been like written down for this. Like these models have been around for 20 years and I think that the paper that was published on the, the likelihoods was maybe seven years ago. Uh, so it's again, just a intractable issue for network models. It's interesting to me that a lot of these models, network models, which you know, could in principle be very highly dimensional to, to um, describe the, the relative position of everything, two dimensions is often enough. Do people ever make uh, three-dimensional plots where time is the third dimension? Um, I haven't. I haven't seen it. Usually when people do three-dimensional plots of these, um, they just put the network in a 3D space and they use an algorithm to place it in 3D instead of placing it um, in 2D. And so, but doing it in time is, um, is an interesting thing. Usually in time you would do the panels um, like I showed uh, at the beginning where you have the first wave of data, then the second wave then the third wave to sort of see the differences over time. Um, but doing it three-dimensionally is definitely interesting. Are there any cool, are there any cool visualizations to compare DAGs or, or actually network graphs to each other? So for example, you have the true output, you have a simulated output, 
it's visually tedious to try and compare each node and each connection. Are there cool ways to sort of visualize that in aggregate or any ideas on how you might do that? Yeah, so uh, you and my advisor had the same question. And so that's actually something that I'm working on um, right now sort of as part of uh, the second chapter of my thesis. So definitely, yeah, an open question. And uh, like uh, Thomas's talk earlier, there's you often end up with these hairballs. And so trying to visualize these things in an informative way is really hard. So that's definitely an open question as well. Um, so looking at these different models and trying to discern, you know, why one uh, is fitting better than the other, how do you kind of disentangle, uh, since you're, you have these network properties that you have in there, and then you also have a utility function, how do you disentangle, uh, does this model not fit because of my network properties or because I, there's some exotic utility function that I'm not taking into account? Right, that's like the exact question that we want to answer by exploring this uh, model visualization more because we're not quite sure uh, how this software that we're using to fit these models is working. Um, and so that's part of the reason that we're doing all of this is because we want to understand, you know, what exactly is going on in the correlation to make these things look this way. And what exactly are the underlying um, and confounding factors. Just a follow up on that. Yeah. So does that mean it allows you to uh, pivot, for instance, the functional form of things like the utility function across multiple uh, parameters? Uh, if I, th I think I, I might understand what you're saying, but maybe not. But uh, what you, the utility function is pretty much always this linear combination of the parameter and then the network statistic or the covariate statistic. Um, and so I haven't seen any other forms other than just that linear combination, um, but that in and of itself is complicated enough. And then you incorporate that into the, um, the rate function. You might want to incorporate network statistics or uh, covariate statistics into that as well. And here we just had a simple one over n uh, function for that. And so there's all sorts of things that can go wrong and be confounding and confusing and things like that, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>